The following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. Welcome back to the Options Insider Radio Network. And we're taking a break from our traditional coverage here to do something a little bit different, to take advantage of the fact that we're all down here at the 2012 Options Industry Conference. And this conference brings together not just a variety of participants in the options space, brokers, exchanges, what have you, but also a variety of the media that covers the options space. And it seemed like an interesting opportunity to do something that I've been banding about for a while, the idea to do a, a roundtable on the state of options and or derivatives coverage in the financial media. And we have three great participants here joining me on the program today to help us do just that, starting off with Nina Metta. She is the reporter extraordinaire over at Bloomberg. Nina, welcome to the show. I'm so glad we could finally get you on. It's been so long, Nina. <laughs> Thank you for my title. <laughs> it's, my, it's, my, it's my life's mission to, uh, to embellish your titles whenever possible, Nina. And sitting next to Nina, we have the new man on the Bloomberg Options totem pole, Nikolai Gameltoft. He is also a reporter on the U.S. Stocks team over at Bloomberg. Nikolai, welcome to the program as well. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, we have the major domo over there, at Markets Media, Terry Flanagan, the managing editor. Terry, welcome to the program to you as well, sir. Thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we're not we'll, used to being questioned. Yeah, I know it's kind of fun. <laughs> I thought we turned the tables a little bit. I think that's why Caitlin was a little, a little. I have to answer questions. No, we'll take it easy on you. Okay, then Nikolai, <clears throat> since you are the uh, the newest entrant to the space here, we're going to start with you and pick on you a little bit. You are, you've been covering the, uh, the options beat at Bloomberg for how long now? Four months. Four months. So this has been a pretty much a, your, your shakedown cruise here. So what's your, what's your general assessment of it coming into it for the first time as someone else from, from the outside, essentially, being assigned to cover options? How does this compare or contrast with some of the other beats you've had to deal with in the past from a complexity or a nuance perspective or any other, uh, any other criteria you can think of? Sure. So I was covering the the general market, uh, U.S. stock market before, and and short selling as well. Uh, and um, the, the options beat is is this small world that's sort of compared to the big sea of of, of equities. Then this is a a, a world that seems much more manageable in, in in terms of sources, in terms of the people who are involved on the buy side and on the sell side. It's it's uh, you you can almost uh, count them. <laughs> uh, and uh, that makes it a lot easier. The challenge is obviously the complexity of the the subject matter. And uh, I mean, starting day one, you have to write about implied volatility and skew and and, and concepts like that 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 seem uh, sort of extremely difficult to to to, to grasp <laughs> just intuitively. And then there's the yes. the math underneath it that 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 supports it, right? So, but as I mean, this is my fourth month, and uh, and hopefully uh, the people who read our stuff uh, will agree that uh, we're making progress. And I'm not the only one who's doing this on on, on Bloomberg. We have a, a, an options reporter in in Amsterdam, Cecil Venucci, who okay. works with me, and then we have a uh, reporter in Atlanta covering sort of the trading on a day-to-day basis, whereas the, the stuff that, that Cecil and I do are much more sort of extreme relationships in the market, bullishness, bearishness. on, on Unusual activity in that sort ex- of realm. Exactly, yeah. You mostly focus on that side and not so much on the exchange business sort of end of the spectrum. No, that would be Nina. Yes, that would be Nina's purview. You do make an interesting point, though. When you drill down into a space like this, you go from the big part of the funnel, which is stocks, 
you drill down into options, you do get a certain benefit. You're right. Most of the people you want to talk to are here at events like this and a few other places across the country. And uh, so that makes it easier. But you do make an interesting point that this space is smaller. From a source sense, it is much easier to get a handle on. But on the flip side, the complexity leaps up orders of magnitude. And you just dove into it right there with things like volatility skew and things that are just bread and butter to this space that add that extra layer of complexity that uh, I think for I think a lot of first-timers, it must be a, a wee bit daunting <laughs> to come to this for the first time. Now, Terry, you've made a transition. How many years ago were you at Bloomberg? I was at Bloomberg from 1996 through 2004, oh, eight so. and a half years, approximately. Eight and a half glorious years, you, you, <laughs> you forgot to mention. But So you made that transition from Bloomberg to a more, I guess you can say, targeted publication like Markets Media. So what has that transition been like for you going from speaking to a, a somewhat more general audience to the the choir so to speak right well i do uh, i did have a stint in between i was at a high yield in the independent research firm that we we covered high yield bonds so it's only been the past two and a quarter years that i've been involved in covering market structure issues which includes options i'm hardly an options specialist but uh, i i do think uh also, I'd say my eight years at Bloomberg did help me kind of give me a general financial knowledge. Also, I did pursue the CFA designation, which was a lot of uh, options material as part of that. So that, I think, gave me a good understanding that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And it kind of allowed me to, I think, cover it better in my current position than I would have otherwise. Gave you a little bit more, perhaps, background or prep than yes, you would have had just – just being assigned to the beat. And- right, which is would need to start from square one, what's a call, what's a put, what's an option. And I, I did at least have that basic understanding while n- never being a true expert in the area nor an uh, options trader myself. I did at least have the, you know, have a basic understanding of the framework of how options work, and I was able to, uh, I think, move a little quicker in terms of getting some depth of coverage. Well, Nikolai, that, that's a good point, too. What is it like when they first assign you to this beat? Do they do they go through that process saying here here's your Natenberg options implied volatility kind of 101, or is it left pretty much up to your own devices to familiarize yourself with the beat that they assign you to? What's the process like that over at at Bloomberg? Well, there was there was a uh, a handover from uh, my uh, predecessor in the job, Jeff Kearns, Jeff. and and um, who who spent five years on this beat covering options. So he was obviously obviously the the in house expert, and he moved to a different beat within Bloomberg. So he and mentored you. He, you under he, his wing, he so mentored me. We, I mean, Bloomberg also has other resources in terms of the experts in, in, in these fields that, 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 that help me out. And then you talk to sources. You just hit the phone and you call up and say, hey, I'm new to this beat. What does this mean? What, what is it? Uh, I don't understand when things move in this direction and that thing moved down. And, and um, how do you use the Bloomberg terminal? And, and, uh, and then we have p- people on the product specialist side at Bloomberg as well and, and, uh, and account managers who cover the, the derivatives sp- space and from a sales perspective. Uh, they will also be very knowledgeable about the space. So you, so you, you, can, know, you can draw on those as well. a lot of assets to draw from there. Exactly. The team. Yeah. And now, Nina, you cover a – it's interesting because it is such a targeted space, but yet there are different and kind of diverse elements within it, and you cover a little bit different beat. You're not so much doing the – day-to-day upside call activity in IBM, but more the hardcore, nitty-gritty market structure. Why don't you break that down a little bit for our listeners of what your day-to-day primarily consists of? Um, I spend a lot of time at SEC.gov and SECHistorical.org. Scintillating <laughs> reading, by the way. You must have no trouble sleeping at all. In there. That keeps me up, actually. Okay. Um, I write mainly about institutional trading and exchanges and how exchanges compete with one another and how rules from the SEC generally affect the different types of participants in the marketplace. So that could be exchanges, it could be broker-dealers, it could be institutions, retail brokers. On the equity side, there are also other entities like dark pools and internalizers who are executing flow from individual investors that come through retail brokers. So I sort of write about how they compete and how they the strife between them, the contest between between these different types of players and how that pans out in terms of the way trading takes place and, and also how that affects the market share of different exchanges. And I write, I write more about the stock side, so I write much more about the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ and BATS and Direct Edge. Um, but I also write about options and the same sorts of issues, these market structure, these broad market structure issues. And I'll add that I'm never asked to help with the other stories that Nikolai <laughs> and Cecile and the other reporters work on because I don't understand that stuff as well. Um, and I don't write about trading at all. I write about 
broader or more nitty-gritty sorts of issues that affect the way trading works, but not what's actually happening in the markets in terms of you know puts and calls and prices and skew and that sort of thing. You've been able to carve out a nice little niche for yourself over there where there aren't many people doing what you do, which is kind of more of the longer form, in the weeds kind of market structure type reporting that we see on some of the, like you said, like people living on sec.gov and some of these other outlets that I think most of us recoil from in terror. On a right. It's a very so. nerdy beat I'm on. <laughs> well, let's get into some of that complexity of the beat for a second, because it is, like you said, on the surface, a very nuanced and, and complex space. And yet, the way different publications handle that, I think, is interesting. You know, obviously, we have several representatives from Bloomberg here, so that's an interesting place to start. And Bloomberg... I think on the surface, a lot of people would assume that Bloomberg assumes that that the audience coming to that publication would have a certain level of nuance, a certain level of sophistication. It is not, for example, a USA Today, which is being handed out at every hotel room. You really need to dumb down the content to that base level of of consumer. And yet, Bloomberg tends not to view it that way. Bloomberg tends to view subject matter like this with the uh, what was what we were discussing earlier Terry what was the uh, the the metaphor you were repeating to me the the mantra you have to keep in mind at all Bloomberg articles it was that every article must be able aunt agatha must be able to understand every article aunt agatha is the mythical aunt i believe a creation of the uh, editor in chief and founder of bloomberg news matt winkler who believes that every article must sort of stand on its own, stand independently, and be able to be understood. shouldn't be inside baseball. That, that's a term used a lot and kind of uh, be too complex for the average reader. Now, that, that's an interesting approach for something like a Bloomberg. And we see similar approaches with some of the Dow Jones publications and some of the other large mainstream publications that, that deal with this, which is they, they do take that approach. They don't, they don't look at this very targeted subset of a subset of the market and approach it with any sort of assumption of sophistication on the part of the audience. I mean, how many times when you're writing about whatever it is, derivatives or options or futures, do you have to allocate X percent of your words to defining here's what an option is, here's what a call or a put is? I mean, how many times have you written that paragraph yourself, Nikolai? I'm, I'm sure you probably have it just cut and paste, ready to go. Exactly. We, we have <laughs> the, the, the general... Cut, um, Many templates. S- yes, template that we just paste in. But I think I, my audience, or the, the way I think about the audience, for example, today we wrote about Coke, uh, Coca-Cola, KO, and I think about the the reader for that story is the the, the fund manager who's long the stock but doesn't use options, who just want to know what's going on in the the trading in in in, in Coke in in terms of how people are positioning in the options market because that's seen as a sort of a the future prices of, of equities, right? So he's just curious to see what, are, what is the option market is telling him about, about uh, that particular stock that we're writing about. And then the other part of the audience, I th- as the way, and we haven't done any research on this, I'm just, this is what I'm thinking, is the sales trader or the strategist on the sell side who is looking for ideas, not that we are, pretend to be smarter than they are or informing them, but just like, hey, look, this is an interesting relationship. I know a couple of guys who own Coke. I'm going to call them up and say Coke uh, protection is really cheap because volatility has come down on the stock and the stock is at a 14-year high or whatever. That, you know, that kind of, uh, that's how I think about the audience in terms of when we write about single stocks. And then if we write about ETFs or we write about indices, I think that's for a, a more general audience in terms of just people being interested. Okay, so... Um, the VIX hit a record high, or I mean, these are things that everybody who are watching this market will have seen or know. But it's we're just sort of quoting people that are interesting, who manage a lot of money, maybe, and then people want to hear what they're saying. And um, so that that's that's sort of the, the 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 audience. And then I think there might be a sophisticated retail uh, investor out there also looking at our stories, uh, sort of, but. That I would say is the minority of the people who who we we think of when we write stories. That's interesting because you so the, you then do assume yourself a certain level of sophistication on your audience, even if you're the mantra is to write to the Aunt Martha. What did you? What was it? Aunt Agatha. Aunt Agatha. <laughs> sure. Aunt Agatha. So that's interesting that, that you do take that approach. And I know Nina, you've bumped into that a few times yourself, having to deal with you know perhaps dialing back some of the things you really wanted to write about because they have. That that mantra in place. What's your what's your viewpoint on your audience and how Bloomberg perhaps approaches the the typical derivatives or options audience and perhaps dialing down some of the things you want to write about to 
to reach a more mainstream as opposed to a more targeted type of audience? Well, I'm, I'm happiest if I'm writing sort of the inside baseball type articles because then it, it's, more, it's more intellectually challenging um, for me. It's more fun, and you can, you can really probe or analyze some issues pretty deeply. Um, but at Bloomberg, as, as both Nikolai and Terry were saying, the goal is to write for a broader audience so people in other areas of the financial industry or their cousins or aunts can understand the articles and benefit from it by just having a better grip on, on some areas of finance. So it, it was a challenge, certainly, when I shifted over to Bloomberg to write more broadly. The goal, I think, for any reporter or any good reporter is always to broaden the, the article and the topic you're writing about so that it can pull other people in and not to start out in the weeds at the very top of the article, maybe to save that for a bit further down. Um, but it was still harder for me coming to Bloomberg to do that because so much that I write about is is complicated and needs explanation. So when the explanation has to be fairly high up in an article, as you ex- as you bring up some of these issues, that re- forces you to push down some of the meatier subjects further down in the story, and you have to explain a lot as you go along. So it's it's challenging to find that balance. Um, where you're explaining enough for someone who doesn't understand the topic as you go along, and and yet for the people who are specialists and experts in the yeah, area, you want to some value them, for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's a balancing act, and you know I fall off fairly often, <laughs> I think, but it's um it's it's hard. Yeah, you know, because in so much of the audience of Bloomberg is the proverbial terminal buyer, and they're obviously a sophisticated audience, and they want more than just what's happening now, snapshots. They want real added value, and so when you start leaning towards one way or the other, you tend to annoy or not satisfy one extreme or the other. You're right, it is a very difficult balance. Now, Terry, you get to walk a little bit different tightrope over at Markets Media because you do have a a little bit different audience. How, how do you take tackle that same subject over there? Sure. Uh, yeah, Markets Media is not a publication that you will pick up a, at your dentist's office. <laughs> it's not something that uh, is meant for broad readership. But at the same time, uh, as Nina points out, you, you don't I mean, I come from Bloomberg. That's where I cut my teeth journalistically, uh, if, if that's a word. Uh, great training, arguably the greatest news organization in the world, and I had a, a, a lot of, of really great training and a lot of, of takeaways from that. So my approach right now, but I do think my recollection at Bloomberg is, if anything, they do err on the side of over-explaining, of over-dumbing it down at times. So what I do, and we're at a smaller place, there's not a whole lot of editorial uh, oversight like there is at Bloomberg. There's not a lot of layers of of editorial to get through at times. So I have a certain leeway. So what I've I've taken a lot with me from Bloomberg, and I do, uh, as Nina said, I kind of make it broad early on in the article and be able to for someone to lead into it who might not have a deep expertise in, in the subject matter and get into to details more later on in the in the article. But what is important, we need to add value for these options market participants, many of whom have been in the industry for ten years or twenty years or even more. And sometimes that is very difficult. I for example I have a colleague, a fairly new reporter who's been on the beat for less than a year and some of his stories are kind of straight shot stories about kind of pontificating about options val- volume things like that it's not you know through no fault of his own but it's tough to come in and have not much financial background and not a lot of experience and be expected to add value for people who have many decades of experience and need some sophistication so it is certainly balancing act we need to err on the side of making it over overly sophisticated rather than overly dumb not dumb, but overly dumbed down. But the the right, the, where is the sweet spot is a constant struggle, I think, for, for any journalist covering this, this beat. Yes, there should be some degree of nuance between USA Today on one hand, something like Options Insider on the other hand, where we are completely preaching to the choir, and we know that, and everything we write and all the audio we produce, we have that luxury of being able to kind of aim over our audience's heads a little bit because most of them will get it, and the few who don't will be motivated to come learn more because they're coming to an outlet like ours of their own volition. They're highly motivated motivated to learn more and do more about options. So there seems to be a very fertile middle ground in there somewhere, which something like a Bloomberg or a journal or could easily occupy going after that more sophisticated but not a 100% specialist in the options realm. You know, And it seems I kind of agree with you. Sometimes I think that publications like, not to you know, pick on Bloomberg, you guys just happen to be in the room today, uh, but you know, publications like Bloomberg and also the journal to a degree and Dow Jones tend to air 
or lean more towards the side of USA Today versus a something like an Options Insider. Where when you start doing that, you kind of have to wonder, you know, who's really serving that large audience in the middle that could use a little bit more value added, but they don't need a full breakdown of volatility skew every time. But so it is an interesting middle ground. I mean, I, I can't complain. It gives us a lot of traffic, so it certainly is not a bad thing for our business. But I, I would love to see more of that tackled by the very large readership groups like the Bloombergs and like the journals, because it is a great opening for you guys to really bring some of this to and, and raise the level of the audience out there. I think there's also um, a development at different magazines or publications that takes place. Because I was at another place before Bloomberg called Traders Magazine. And at some point, we started covering the options industry. And at first, I had, I started writing about options in 1999, but didn't write a whole lot about it after that for a number of years. And when we started writing about options, we were writing, you know, more babyish sort of articles. They were not sophisticated, but but part of it is also just getting the reporters and the editors used to the subject and more familiar with it. It was a ramp-up period. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you don't, if you start writing about a new subject, you don't know what's news, you don't know what's interesting, you don't know if something you've come across is is worth writing about or, or pursuing or whether this is old hat and everyone has known it for five years. And and some of that education just comes slowly, of course. And the, the magazine where I was started writing much more sophisticated articles as we became more sophisticated ourselves and had a better grip of what we were writing about. And and I think the same, that I've seen the same also at Bloomberg. Um, there are now, Jeff was writing about this subject, but once it started broadening out, there are many more reporters now who are writing about it. So there's Nikolai, there's Cecile, but there are also a lot of other reporters on the stocks team who contribute to the articles. And to even contribute to the options articles and the columns that are being written, they have to have a grasp of these concepts that they knew nothing about six months ago or eight months ago. And there's been a very rapid increase in their education. And I think Many of the articles have gotten more sophisticated as reporters and editors have gotten more familiar. So it wasn't just a small coterie of people writing about it. It's, it's gotten broader, and, and they also have to search for more articles because they're writing more frequently. So, so it all builds on, you know, on, on that and, and hopefully snowballs so that the articles do become, become more interesting to a broader but also deeper and more expert um, type audience. So the increased options coverage has percolated through or perhaps infected <laughs> the rest of the Bloomberg team. And as a result of that, the coverage has improved. And imagine what could happen if that then percolates out to the masses more. And we do kind of replicate that same approach to that large middle ground audience who I think could respond in a similar way, a little bit more nuance, and all of a sudden they'll They'll start rising uh, to the uh, to the material, but I think I think that's a business decision at the end of the day for for someone for an organization like Bloomberg, right? Yes, definitely. We we service the three hundred and fifteen thousand terminal subscribers. Is there a market for a, a, a mid size uh, whatever operator to 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 address that retail audience? Um, yeah, I mean then. We should ask uh, E-Trade and Ameritrade and and, 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 and and those people if, if that's a product they want to sell. Right? I, don't, I don't think – I mean I have nothing to do with the business side of Bloomberg, but I don't think that's that's in our our future right now at least. No, yeah. definitely Bloomberg has made that decision that, you know, where they want to come down in this type of coverage. And it, it makes total sense from the, you know, the, the broad reach perspective. I think they still think of themselves as uh, very much being, you know, syndicated throughout a variety of publications around the world. And they want to make sure they're accessible to that audience. And if that means sometimes sacrificing the terminal guy uh, with what he needs or wants in order to make sure uh, the guy in the Jerusalem Times can understand the article that he's getting, then I think that's kind of where they've fallen on that spectrum. At least that's, that's my perspective. You might, uh, you might have a different, uh, different take on that. Speaking of different takes, um, one of the other issues we bump into time and again when we're talking about options coverage in the media is, of course, that the salacious aspect of it, too. We all too, all too often see so many outlets dwelling on the, let's say, the, the less than, uh, than, than savory nature of some of, of the options business. I mean, obviously, options have been pretty much been very prone to scandal, very linked to a lot of high-profile scanners in, in years. Every rogue trader that comes along is derivatives-related in some way, shape, or form, and a lot of publications enjoy pointing that out <laughs> on a regular basis. And so we do see a lot of editors. I don't think this is a reporter thing. I think it's more of the editors, you know, leaning into content like that because it, it is a good headline. I, I, can't, I can't dispute with that. And page views, at the end of the day, do, do drive the business. But, you know, there is certain, a certain element of that as well, which I think tends to sometimes distort some of the coverage of, of Road Trigger X and how the – and very much leaning towards – of the pendulum, leaning towards the side of 
derivatives, and I hate to use that word because it's so pejorative, but let's just say options because the derivatives has been so weighed down with other contexts now. But options are and being portrayed as more of a risk additive tool rather than the way they were constructed, which is you know some sort of risk mitigation tool. And yet, whenever we see time and again any sort of large financial scandal, AIG, you know, Rogue Trader X, Rogue Trader Y, it's usually linked to some sort of improper use of derivatives. Usually the improper nature of that is not exactly drilled into the into the reader's head. It's more of, look, derivatives did this. Um, I'm curious what you guys' thoughts are on that. I mean, I don't, I don't think Bloomberg or Markets Media are particular culprits in that, uh, in that thing. But still, we do see a lot of that out there in the broad media. And that typically is what passes for options slash derivatives coverage in a lot of outlets that aren't Bloomberg, that aren't the journal. It will only materialize when there is that headline grabbing someone, Rogue Trader X, wiped out another bank because he sold downside puts and in overwhelming quantities that should have been caught and never was. So, um, Terry, maybe you, you've seen a different, uh, a wide variety of, uh, of coverage in different outlets. How do you think that maybe tarnishes the overall coverage of options? Certainly. I think it, it can tarnish that if uh, a certain perspective is accepted as gospel. For example, any newspaper might be able to call up an uh, Occupy Wall Street representative and say, how awful are options? <laughs> They're a function of the Goldman Sachs, the vampire squid in Wall Street and all those places. And they'll get a lot of juicy quotes from an Occupy Wall Street person, the representative, saying how awful options are. If they ran with that story, that would not be good for the options market. But I would say there is a flip side to that as well. If you uh, listen to uh, what the OIC folks say. They say options are great for everyone. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily say that, but they would say that uh, options are need to be used more by portfolio managers. They need to be explained more. Maybe options aren't for everyone. So I think someone who takes that perspective as fa- as fact, as truth, needs to sort of drill down on that as well. I'm sure there are some money managers out there who would disagree for whatever reason. It's not that they haven't looked at options, but maybe they, they have and it's not for them, or maybe they've tried it and, and it isn't for them. So I, I think you know there's certainly two perspectives out there and everything in between. I think what can be faulty reporting or editing is if you take one of those perspectives and don't balance it with, with the other perspective. That's true. I mean, and we all too often do see people, you know, like I said, it is – very easy to take a juicy quote like that and run with it because the clicks are clicks, and that, that generates a lot more clicks than a headline that says derivatives are a balanced risk-mitigating type of tool. Um, also, I think Aunt Agatha um, isn't always going to be reading the normal options columns that Bloomberg's or other publications are writing, and they will be more likely to come across these articles when there is a scandal or something happens. So they're more likely to be influenced in terms of their perception of an industry or an asset class or something when big events like that happen. So there's kind of more risk involved with those sorts of stories. And because there is a lot of headline news and there's legitimate news that people are writing about, you have more people, whether it's reporters or editors, and in every this happens at every publication, there are more people looking at that story or involved in that story who don't cover that area. So um, the articles may wind up being skewed in different ways than they would be if someone had more time and, and you know, the people who normally cover those issues are writing about them. Yes, definitely. It spills across multiple asset classes and multiple purviews. So everyone gets to weigh in on these type of things. And you're right also, if, if, the, if Aunt Agatha only sees derivatives once a year when it's in some headline-making scandal, it's definitely going to color her perception. On the other side, and perhaps this is naive of me, but maybe I would, it would be interesting to see if the editors knew that and knew that this is type of the type of content that only kind of percolated out when there was a headline-making tale, if they took the same care that they take with explaining everything and balancing everything for that Aunt Agatha thing to also maybe include the disclamatory paragraph in there that this is somehow improper use of the tools and it's not, you know, like they always do, leaving the blame on this is, you know, XYZ derivative is awful and this is what caused the scandal when in reality it was improper behavior. Nice. It's blaming the tool as opposed to the person who used the tool. Nikolai, would you agree with that as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I haven't had much experience with it, but I think where I've come in, into to contact is when I'm trying to cultivate buy-side sources in pension funds. And I said, do you want to talk on the record about your options trading? And they say, no, we don't want to talk about it because our members don't want – we don't want our members to know or to hear Terrific. about whatever teaches a uh, pension fund in, in somewhere in, in America using options because the members are then going to call them up and say, why are you using options? Why are you using derivatives? That's a dangerous product. 
and and and, and that's that is absurd, right? Because these members are probably much better served with a fund that uses options to either protect on the downside or to uh, boost returns on, on, on the upside. So that is kind of the consequence uh, f- just from a pure coverage perspective that uh, some people just don't want to talk about it because they don't want their their, their clients to know that they're trading uh, options. It's amazing that that mindset still persists. But look, this conference is a perfect example. Simultaneous with the options industry conference is a wealth advisors conference, and that essentially is bringing in very large wealth asset managers who have a lot of assets under management who, for the most part, have little to no concept of options and how they can be implemented. So there still is an enormous audience out there of people who are, in other areas, relatively or very sophisticated, who yet have no concept of something that could that dovetails so easily with something like a simple long-only mutual fund that that is a no-brainer for implementing like you said defensive options and yet that degree of sophistication still is lacking in a lot of a lot of areas well you know we've been chatting for a while i'm glad we can get you guys to sit down it's something i've wanted to do for quite a while to kind of hit on some of the broad strokes and some of the broad points of of options coverage right now in the financial media before we go is there anything else any of you like to like to add about what you see right now in the options landscape or in the options media or some of the interesting things that are catching your eye right now that uh, yeah. I, I think what was interesting when I just came into the beat in early this year we had the the TVIX. Mm-hmm. oh yes I wouldn't call it good timing for you <laughs> yes I was I was just about to say scandal but maybe that that's a, that's a that's a harsh word but but situation yes. where we had this volatility product that a lot of retail investors had invested had invested in, in on, on the belief that volatility was going to spike back up because we we're going to have another repeat of 2011 with European uh, debt crisis and, and, and the VIX was low, so that you know, there was going to mean revert, so there was that uh, effect as well. And, and then they got burned because uh, sort of the complexity of the product and, and – Decoupled, essentially. It got decoupled from reality, mm. basically. It, it went <laughs> rogue. This, this product is just <laughs> – it, 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 it was uh, – one of my editors described it as this psychotic rat that was running around the market and biting everyone and nobody could get it under control. And then, which I thought was a pretty um, colorful uh, way of describing it. But, but I think that what I realized there was that there's a huge retail audience, after all, for these things. I, I think I never had so much response from readers, not Bloomberg readers, but Bloomberg Terminal readers, but uh, Bloomberg.com readers. So average people around America who had bought this thing in, 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 in the belief that they would make money. And they just lost a lot of money uh, in investing in it and, and – it convinced me that there's a big retail yeah. audience for for, in, in, for, for, for these things, uh, but the education effort is maybe to some extent lagging behind when people can get this burned uh, by by a, a, a product. Uh, yes. And I think we, people lost a lot of money, I mean, t- based on the anecdotal stories that I heard. Yes, people piling into products that they're not particularly – cognizant of how they work or how they're how they're constructed and we saw a lot of that as well coming into our site and people piling into tvix pre and post decoupling uh it was a, very much a disaster but it's also a great example of you know how a beat like yours could really add value by you know taking an, uh, something like that that you might assume is relatively sophisticated but yet has actually a broad penetration and be able to add a little bit of nuance a little bit of color describing exactly what is going on because it was a very confusing very hectic situation for a while no one knew where these fun flows were coming from and the, the tinfoil hat people were saying that perhaps it was a malicious flow of funds that was designed to purposely decouple tvix by some other competing firms and it was a lot of a lot of uh, rumor and innuendo flying around that ex- that that situation so something where you can come in and provide a little a little analysis a little nuance maybe one step beyond what the what the average reader would want but a little more color that's a perfect example of something like that that is of great benefit to the reader and you know, we've we've been surprised by that here too quite frankly cuz we traditionally cater to a, a very hardcore audience and our audio does as well and yet we started about 3 or 4 years ago putting out the panel audio from this conference and some of these com- some of these sessions are Hardcore minutia, OTC credit default swap clearing panels, things like that that are about as, as into the weeds as you can get. And we put it out to our site, of course, which is a, 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 a targeted audience. But we also put it out to iTunes and other areas, which are predominantly retail in, in their makeup. And I've been amazed at how they devour this stuff. And it's ridiculously hardcore topic, topics like that that I might not even want to listen to. People in retail en masse are downloading and they keep doing it for years after the fact. We keep these files up, and for years afterwards, people come in and download OTC Panel X and OTC Panel Y. So there is a, a broad penetration and a demand in what I would 
considered to be a typically retail audience for this very, very targeted type of content. So that, that to me was very surprising as well. It's kind of like the TVX was to you, that there is this overall penetration in, in the retail. No, all I would add, Mark, is that I think this has been an interesting perspective, the a media covering media, so to speak. I did have one other experience uh, when I was a Bloomberg reporter. I was covering an oil conference in Calgary, and there was some Calgary TV station doing a piece on media covering the oil conference. So I was on Calgary TV about 12 years ago. and I would That's say, where I know you from. Right. Cow- would, you're missing the cowboy hat. I, I would just like to add, I hope we all get those fancy options inside of shirts as compensation That's for your, participation. <laughs> That's your consolation prize for, uh, for showing up on the panel today. Fancy shirts for all of you. We, can, we can receive that at Bloomberg. Oh, for, okay. for, for, <laughs> we'll send it to your, to your home address. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming in today. I think this is a great – I'm glad we were able to do this. Maybe we can recon, reconvene this once a year and just kind of do a state of the options media because I think it's an interesting topic. And there is a lot of interest in this and from a broad number of audiences. The institutional guys like to see how the market's being covered. The growing audience of advisors and, of course, retail are all very interested in how the market is analyzed and covered and portrayed in, in a wide variety of media. So it's an interesting, interesting topic I think we'll have to rediscover again perhaps – at OIC 2013. The preceding program was a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com radio or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes.